Um, excited to teach the word today. Um, it's been a been a hard week uh, for a lot of people in this country. I got a bunch of friends in Nashville and also in uh, Little Rock, and I've talked to several of them this week, and uh, just family and friends and some uh, extraordinary extraordinary circumstances due to the shooting in Nashville and and uh, the tornado in uh, Little Rock. Anybody have any friends or family in Nashville? Little Rock. Wow, okay. Yeah, let's pray. Let's pray for those, those things. Lord, we ask for your grace and help and comfort. Uh, Lord, your word tells us to mourn with those who mourn. And uh, Lord, we just pray that your mighty Holy Spirit would come around those who have lost uh, loved ones, children, uh, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers. And uh, Lord, we just pray for your blessing and for your healing. Uh, for those circumstances in Nashville and also in Little Rock and um, so much devastation. But Lord, you uh, are the great comforter, the great healer. And uh, Lord, we just pray for your provision in every way. Lord, we also pray for your peace. We pray for your help. I thank you today uh, that you are with us. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, what I share this morning will bring uh, your hope, your truth, your word uh, into our hearts this morning, and that, Lord, you, you water your seed. You make it grow. Thank you, O oh God, for the faith in this room. Thank you, Lord, for faith even as a grain of mustard seed. We bless you, Lord. We thank you that you are mighty and holy and all-powerful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen church. Well, welcome to Crossroads. I want to start by asking you, um, how many of you are good test takers in the room today? How many of you are good? Go ahead, get those hands high. Yeah. How many of you are good test takers? All right. And test takers. Yeah. And how many of you are not good test takers, but you know you're smarter than those people who are good? <laughs> Come on. Well, I want to introduce you today to what may be the hardest test on the planet. All right, do you know about this? The Master Sommelier. It was established in 1969. There are many levels. Uh, there are three certifications, actually four. There's a certified sommelier, an advanced sommelier, uh, and a master sommelier. So if you've ever been in a restaurant and you asked for the sommelier to come over, if you're like me, you have no idea what you're going to say to him. You just want to meet him. Well, if he comes over, if he's wearing one of these pins, you should recognize that. He, he's done some hard work to become a certified sommelier, and he's done harder work to become an advanced sommelier, and even harder still to become a, a master sommelier. If he's not wearing one of those pins, don't say anything. Don't ask him where it is. You know, it's a, it's a progress. It's a journey. But the master sommelier established in 1969, is truly one of the hardest tests on the planet. Today in the world, there are 15 million restaurants. In, in America alone, there are more than 700,000. And certainly some of those are pubs and cafes and things that don't require a sommelier, but it gives you an idea. There are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of very, very nice restaurants in our country and in the world. Fewer than 300 people have ever become master sommeliers since 1969. If that tells you how difficult it is, this is just Italy. Who loves wine in here? It's okay. I know we're in the church. I'm not Baptist anymore, but that's... <laughs> I'm talking about communion. Just in Italy alone, there are 20 wine regions... All right, 350 grape varieties. Actually, some say there are thousands. There are all kinds of hybrids. Subregions, villages, just in Italy alone. And this master sommelier exam covers the globe. There are three sections to the master sommelier exam. I want to read just a little bit for you. There are three sections. One is theory, one is practical and one is tasting. In the theory section, candidates 
have to speak with authority on the wine areas of the world and their products. They must know principal grape varieties used in winemaking and the areas of the world in which they're cultivated. They must know flavor profiles of each of those regions and even the subregions. They must know wine law. They must answer a ton of questions for a panel of master sommeliers sitting there asking them questions about their knowledge. The practical part of the exam, they have to serve wine. They have to use an extensive menu and of, of food items and wines and pair them perfectly. They must speak with thorough knowledge. And, and again, the, 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 uh, the master sommeliers are the ones who are pretending to be the customers. They're sitting at the table asking them all these things, and they must do it with dignity and poise and diplomacy. And then you come to the third part of the sommelier exam, which is a blind tasting. Six wines, three reds, three whites. They're put in front of you. Remember, in Italy alone, 350 grape varieties, 20 regions, subregions, then little villages. And that candidate is expected to give you acidity, flavor profile, alcohol, all of these descriptives that, that let the Somalia examiners know exactly, they, they must know exactly what they're talking about. And they describe these wines. Remember, it's a blind tasting. There are six wines on the table. They must tell you the country, the region, the candidates, and the year it was bottled. It's, it's extraordinary what these candidates go through. So if you ever see someone in a restaurant that's wearing a master sommelier pin, by all means, acknowledge that accomplishment. So there will be a test. Wouldn't it be something if there was a test for our Christian maturity, our spiritual development, our character? Steve was talking about holiness last week. Wouldn't it be something if there was a test that could test and measure our righteousness? Is there? You better believe there is. We don't recognize most of them. But there will be a test. Let's read James 1. Tell you what, there are Bibles under your seat or in front of you, sorry, in front of you. So I want to read for you James 1. Or you know what? Why don't somebody here read it? Turn to James 1 and uh, we'll do a little participation this morning. Verse 2 through 4. This is your first test. <laughs> yes, two, two through four. And go on, yeah. So there will be a test. There are trials, there are temptations, there are tribulations. There are all kinds of tests in our lives that come to us every day. But I think that most of the time, we probably don't recognize them. I mean, these are, these are spiritual opportunities where if, if we're steadfast, if we're faithful, I mean, we can, we can sort of see what's happening in our life. There's a proverb I love, uh, Proverb 24.10 says, if you falter in times of trouble... How small is your strength? And I used to be really frustrated by that verse. I thought, okay. But the reality is, when there is adversity, when there is trouble, when there is trial and tribulation, at least I can see if I falter. At least I can see if suddenly fear, worry, anxiety rises up inside of me, right? Today is Palm Sunday, and Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. By the way, thank you guys for leading worship. Just awesome. Beautiful to just prepare. I mean, that's a, that's a time of, of worship. This is a time of worship. Fellowship is a time of worship. But I so appreciated that time this morning, Trinity and Julie and Tim and Chris. Um. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and I want to read something. I want to read one of those accounts for us 
from Matthew. And if you want to follow along, it's in Matthew uh, verse, uh, chapter 21. Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And what I want to watch for here, I kind of want to follow up a little bit and, and go to a sort of a part two when Steve was talking about holiness last week and righteousness. We know we're called to that. We know we are called to that, to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect, to be holy as the Heavenly Father is holy. But, but how, do, how do we get there? So what I want to look at in this story this morning as Jesus rides into Jerusalem is one of the qualities of Christ our Lord, one of the qualities of the Godhead that we also made in His image, He's given us the capacity and through Him to demonstrate to this world, to live, to have in our experience. So on ch in chapter 21, the triumphal entry, uh, I'm reading from the ESV, the books, uh, the Bibles in, in the seats are ESV. And let's just read this together. Can we do something this morning? Um, can we stand while we, while we read the word of the Lord? The word of the Lord from chapter 21 in the Gospel of Matthew. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when they, draw, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, to the daughter, to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, "'Hosanna to the Son of David!' Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Amen, church. Amen. Please have a seat. Yes. So Jesus comes at the beginning of the festival of the Passover. The whole city is celebrating. This, remember, this is the first feast, and God told the nation of Israel, celebrate the Passover. I have brought you out of Egypt. Oh my goodness, they all knew so clearly what it meant that they were passed over. And this was their week-long festival and celebration. And this first day, as we see in the scripture, the people are stirred up already. But then as Jesus comes, he fulfills some of the most memorable prophecies from Scripture that the Jewish nation knows. He fulfills this, and, and they refer to it, Matthew refers to the, gospel, I mean, the, the, the prophet and priest Zechariah, that, hey, he's going to ride in on a donkey. And we're going to read this in just a minute. And they also refer to David, the Psalms of David. Behold, he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, the Jewish nation, when they are saying this on the streets, one of the other Gospels says that the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke your disciples. They said that because they knew full well what these people around him were saying. They were saying, this is the one. This is the Messiah. Hosanna, the one who saves and they're shouting this in the streets. And the Pharisees are like, oh, wait a second. This is blasphemous. And what does Jesus say to them? He says to them, if they are quiet, even the stones will cry out. So they knew what was happening when these people were shouting. And Jesus is on a donkey. 
I want to look at Zechariah just a couple of verses down. If we follow that verse that Matthew quoted a few more, we see a couple of things. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The blood of my covenant will be with you. So the donkey, God doesn't miss a chance to impart profound symbolism. And Jesus is fulfilling that. Jesus is part of the Godhead. Go and get a donkey. In the Old Testament, when people rode in, kings rode into war, they weren't on donkeys. They were on stallions, horses, dressed, full and ready in battle regalia. But when they came in peace, they would come with a donkey, on a donkey, or with gifts on a donkey. And so Jesus says, go and get this donkey and the foal. There are two of them. And he says one of them, and one of the gospels says that one of them had never been ridden. Now that's interesting. Could it hold Jesus? I don't know. If it was just a colt of a donkey, can you imagine how small that is? But somehow Jesus, and it just must look so strange, feeble, weak, but it's representing the peace and ultimately that quality that I referred to earlier that we can find in this, the humility of Christ. The profound humility of Christ. So, there will be a test. How are we going to get this character that God has? And how is it demonstrated in our lives? I think it's demonstrated in very simple ways every day. Certainly there are huge tests that we all go through. We can identify those easily. But the ones that are smaller, that just occur every day, that are testing our character, our faith, our holiness, our spiritual development, that Christ formed in us, our Christ-likeness, the spirit within us, or the flesh, these tests are going to happen every day. And, and, and just with a little tongue-in-cheek and maybe humor, I want, to, I want to give us some examples that maybe we can relate to today to sort of stir our hearts and, and maybe, we, maybe we experience a little conviction together. That's not a bad thing. Maybe we experience a little revelation and hopefully we experience the advance of the kingdom of God within our hearts, the advance of the filling of the Spirit and the Christ-likeness that we're all being called to. And as I said, how are we going to get there? How are we going to get there? Well, I want to put some tests up here that we've maybe many of us have experienced and see if there's something up here that you can relate to, okay? The first test, here we go. My wife and I are in the kitchen and she gives me some simple, unsolicited advice on how I might communicate, better communicate with the kids. Is that, is that a test? Fair enough. How might we respond to that? By the way, it could go the other way. How might I respond to that? Well, I, I might, A, tell her a few things she could do better also. <laughs> Done that. Yeah. I might, B, dig my heels in and mansplain why I must communicate in this way. I think the women understand that more than the men. Why? <laughs> or C, pause and say with a gentle heart, you know, you're right. Thank you. I, I, I would practice those words. My wife's sitting in the booth today, by the way. She can check me on all these. <laughs> um, practice those words because... That'll, that'll open some communication for you immediately, immediately. Let's look at another one. Here's another, here's another little test. While scrolling social media, I see an amazing post from a friend of mine who has pretty much everything I ever wanted. 
I could A, unfriend them. <laughs> You've done it. You've done it. B, I call another friend to tell them just how arrogant that is to post things like that. Or I could B, or C, I, I wish them well and get back to work because I'm at work. Are, are there any tests that... Did you recognize that test? Let's look at another one. After two hours of relative silence, my wife says, we need to talk about something. I could A, unfriend her. B, look at my phone and tell her I have some openings in May. I could see, answer, of course, and conveniently figure, forget my non-apologetic attitude just yesterday. Not my unapologetic attitude. There, there's, there, yeah, you're with me? There's, there's a difference. My non-apologetic attitude. Of course, honey. Of course we can talk. Or D, prepare to listen and understand without defensiveness. With love, peace, and patience. And I know what you're thinking. That's impossible. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Here's another one. I feel in a moment of spiritual inspiration that the Lord has spoken to me about helping provide for a friend in need. I could A, pray for their need and ask God to provide for them. B, dismiss the notion quickly and say to myself, that was not God's voice. Do we do that? I could C, give thanks to the Lord and take action to help meet that need. Number five, I receive a call from one of my children informing me they've made a terrible mistake. I could A, wish them luck and end the call. B, I could react with anger and a demeaning tone to make my point and increase their shame. I just didn't see it that way when I did that. C, I listen with grace and compassion and try not to jump to conclusions. Or D, I ask the Lord for guidance in the moment. You see, there are many, many tests. I have a couple more. A big project I was working on didn't turn out the way I'd hoped. I could blame others and complain about the outcome, shrink from similar challenges in the future, pray and listen for insight from the one who knows and sees all. I could accept responsibility with humility. Are you tracking? Let's do one more. I recently faced a devastating loss that just makes no sense. Anybody ever been there? I grow bitter and ask God, why? Why? I could refuse to take steps of faith or move forward until I have an explanation. Anybody ever done that? Or I could cry out, Holy Spirit, help me. Comfort me. The sacrifices of God are broken and contrite heart. Help, Lord. Or I could let his word light my path. I face a prolonged season of challenging circumstances which test my faith, my character, my Christ-like attitudes. You ever, has you ever been there? How about you? What are some options? A long season. Yeah, let's just hear a couple. I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe you can think with me. That tests my faith, my character, my Christ-like attitudes. Any options? I know you have some. Marriage? Marriage? <laughs> 
That's not the answer. Is that? <laughs> but, but I think we know what he means. I wither. Man. Man. White knucklehead. White knucklehead. Right? I don't know what you're doing, God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be steadfast. What about this one? I experience wild success in business or have a financial windfall. Oh, that's a little different. Is that a test? Is that a test? Yeah. What might you do? Or how have you responded? I mean, I've confessed a few things for you today. <laughs> Anybody have any input on that? I mean, what, what might we do? Could Be thankful. Be thankful. And what was over here? Tithe. Boy, give out of our first fruits. Be grateful. Yeah. I, 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 it, it comes to mind, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, it certainly does. It certainly does. Or become arrogant. Become arrogant. Wow. Wow. Do I have another one? You know, the, the tenth one is blank. What's your test? You know, what's your test? Because they are going to come. I, I want to help us this morning from God's Word discover ways that we can overcome. Because there will be a test. Every day, every day, there will be a test. How shall we pass the tests? I want to give us five ways this morning that we can overcome. And number one is this. It's not about willpower. It is not about willpower. I mean, I want to read something for you. One of the first books I read as a Christian, the first book I read as a follower of Christ, a new follower of Christ, was C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. This is not the copy. This is a replaced copy. But I want to read, I want to read a couple of passages for you that illustrate it's not about willpower. Listen, listen to this, church. And now we begin to see what it is that the New Testament is always talking about. It talks about Christians being born again. It talks about them putting on Christ. About Christ being formed in us. About our coming to have the mind of Christ. So put right out of your head the idea that these are only fancy ways of saying, listen, listen carefully, church. I don't know how many times I read this before I went, oh my goodness, that's what he's talking about. Put right out of your head the idea that these are only fancy ways of saying that Christians are to read what Christ said and then try to carry it out. Wait a second. Wait a second. Put out of your head, he says, that this is just some fancy way of saying that Christians ought to read what Christ said and then just carry it out. If that doesn't quite make sense to you, we're getting closer. They mean something much more than that. They mean that a real person, Christ, in his spirit, here and now, in this very room, where you are saying your prayers, is doing something inside of you. The change which I most need to undergo is a change that my own direct voluntary efforts cannot bring about. But I cannot, by direct moral effect, give myself new motives... After the first steps in the Christian life, we realize that everything which really needs to be done in our souls can only be done by God. Is, is that relieving? Because we have all strived, st striven, I don't know. We've all like worked so hard 
at times, at other times we didn't work very hard. But sometimes we, we've, we've tried with this effort and the strength inside of us to do what the word says. But it's not about willpower. It's actually about the Spirit of God bringing those things out of us. And it's a very strange, counterintuitive thing that I don't, I don't know if we can fully understand. It's like I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm told to go and, and serve. I'm told to go and love. I'm told to go and, and be holy. But, but how am I going to go and do that if I just wait for Christ to do it? That is a very foundational paradox in the faith that, that is actually relieving. Like when we just read this, it, what, what really needs to happen in our souls is something that God himself does. And we have all tried so hard at times to do that in our own power. And so I just want to encourage you, follow Christ this morning. Remember that it is God who does it inside of you. And like I said, if that's starting to sound confusing, I, I think we're getting closer to the actual act of letting the Holy Spirit do it within us. Are you with me? Let's look at number two. By the way, definition of willpower. I just looked this up in the dictionary. Control exerted to do something or restrain impulses. Control exerted to do something or restrain impulses. That's willpower. Number two. First thing, or the second thing we have to do is know what tests you. You see these little tests we just kind of went through, these little multiple choice. Uh, we each have our own and we can spot them every day. And so we have this, the Lord says, hey, don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. When he said it has enough trouble of its own, do you believe that? These are the things that happen within a 24-hour period. We open our eyes in the morning and until we close our eyes and we're in the sleep mode at night. Today has enough trouble of its own. And if we begin to just observe what happens in our life, and see where these tests might appear, that's when we go back. Okay, Lord, it's not about willpower. I, I, I did not, I recognized that response in me that was not of faith and not of your spirit. It was something that I forced. Anybody ever tried to act nice, loving, kind? Has anyone ever had to act kind when you don't feel kind? When something is happening and you all know the, the, the scene at home when it's not going well. There's some, there's some heavy conversation, maybe. Maybe some escalated conversation. And the phone rings. Hey! Oh, great! How are you? And we also do that in other situations as well. I mean, the joy of the Lord. If the joy of the Lord is going to be our strength, let's pray for that. Let's be ready for that. Let's not just try and, and fake that and be happy, be joyful, but let the Lord bring that in us. And I promise you, we start to move close to him when we recognize these tests and we begin to pray about them and say, Lord, I saw that. Well, he's convicting us. He's growing us. He's revealing to us this process of being transformed into his likeness from glory to glory, to glory. And that, as, as followers of Christ, that has to be vision of ours. That has to be a purpose of ours. We can remain stagnant. And we can't avoid those things for days, weeks, years. We can avoid that real transformation that is to happen inside of us. Number three, build your testimony. What do I mean by that? If you recognize these tests and you're watchful for them, be, be good stewards, be wise, be full of the Spirit. You recognize those things and that still small voice comes into your mind, into your heart. Derek, Derek, I'm calling you. I'm calling you to something greater. I'm calling you to a humble life, a life full of humility, a life that's lived for my glory with me as your strength, when I hear the Holy Spirit calling me to that and I respond to those tests, guess what? 
You're going to have something happen. Might be tomorrow, might be next week, but you're going to feel the Spirit of God put that inside of you that causes you to love, that causes you to forgive, that causes you to be humble, that causes you to consider others first, to give sacrificially. It happens. And you know what you do then? That's your testimony. That's your testimony. Many, many years ago, um, Jen and I lived in Centennial. It was in the first or second place. Second place we lived there. She, she'll remember this. Maybe not as well as I do, or maybe better. <laughs> but we were having an argument. I was so angry. So angry. I have no idea what the argument was about. I hope Jen doesn't remember either. I bet she doesn't. <laughs> but I was so angry. Jen, we separate. She goes upstairs. And, and I just prayed. I'm just, I just like, man, what? what? What do I do? What is this? Lord, help me. And let me tell you, like a miraculous healing, God swept through my heart in an instant. And that anger was gone. In me. In an instant. Oh, I was justified. I'm sure I was, right? You know what I'm saying. You, you, you have these reasons why you are justified. This attitude is justified. But by the grace of God, His Spirit swept through me, healed me, delivered me of this anger in like, I mean, less than a second. And I went upstairs and I grabbed Jen. And I said, hey, we are not. We, we are not on separate teams. We are on the same team. The enemy wants us to be separate. The enemy wants us to be angry and accusing each other and divisive. And I just, I just explained this to her and told her what happened to me somehow. And boy, she just received it. She received it. The word says that love covers over a multitude of sins. It really does. It really, really does. And so you and I have to build our testimonies and be watchful of these things when the Holy Spirit is convicting us, transforming us, and calling us to this place of a lived experience that's full of His Spirit and full of His humility, full of His love and grace. Amen? Amen. Let's look at a couple more. Who's your champion? Who is your champion, church? You, individually. It's so important that we have community. The church is a powerful thing when it comes together. And listen, there's a reason that the church is called the body of Christ. And Paul says that each of us is a part. We're a part. We, our champion we're going to find in the Christian community who can encourage you, pray for you, relate to you, and say, I've been there. Hey, man, let's pray for this. Let's expect the power of God to come in and transform. And by the way, the word also says that with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. So if I want a champion, I, I got to be a champion of someone. I need to find those few whom I can serve, whom I can pray for, whom I can encourage. You with me? And finally, oh, it's kind of weird. Our champion is no substitute for our master. That may seem obvious, But drawing near to Jesus and taking a passage like, let's say, chapter 21 in Matthew and watching, listening to how Jesus lived his life, reading those incredible miracles, not just as, here's a passage, now go do it. But Lord, what is the essence of your being? Jesus, help me. At Crossroads, we, we are, are, are always talking and, and, 
and praying about and, and trying to figure out ways like how, how do we answer this call that is over the church to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them all things, Jesus said, that I have taught you, he says in Matthew 28. That's, that's our hope for this church, that together in life together, as we just live life together, enjoy time together, encourage one another, pray for one another, gather for corporate worship, gather out in our community, that the Lord is transforming us into his likeness. And so we, we pray for you every week. Every week the elders get together and pray for this church and pray that the Lord will lead, guide, speak to, provide, deliver, heal. Boy, if you have prayer requests, I'd encourage you to bring them to the elders. But also bring them to that champion, that friend, and share with them. Share with them what you're going through. Share with them whatever is happening in your life so that that person might encourage you as well. And that person might say, hey, let's draw near to Jesus, our Lord. Amen, church? Amen. There will be a test. And it's coming every day. And, you know, just like that master Somalia, you know, these tests are sometimes very difficult. And sometimes they're very subtle. But I would encourage you, be watchful. Open your hearts and your minds to watch and, and, and be watchful for the things that happen in the course of a day. The activity of God is being played out in this world in an imminent way and in a transcendent way. But we are spiritual beings renewed by Christ. And I just want to pray for us this morning that, that we recognize that it is His Spirit inside of us. It is Jesus inside of us. And hey, if you figure out that mystery in a way that you're like, wow, yeah, the Lord showed me how I can let Him do that in me. If you can articulate that, share that with another believer. Share that with another friend and encourage them. I want to invite Trinity and the worship team uh, back up. We're going to close and come to His table in a moment. But let's pray. Let's pray over these things in our lives and just pray for the Lord to be formed in us. Uh, we know that that is something that he's doing. We know that we can pr pray confidently for that. So we're going to worship and take some time. I would encourage you, um, after we pray, just take some time uh, to reflect. I do want to say that the starting place for all of this, the starting place for all of this is renewal in Jesus and being a new creation called into that through the life and death of Jesus and his resurrection, his empowerment, giving us his helper. Let's pray over this. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, uh, God, for your purposes. Oh, holy Lord, Father, we want to avail ourselves to you. And Lord, come before you every day. Every day, Lord, thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, show us, show us how, Lord, to walk with you in a way that glorifies you, Lord, in a way that, Lord, is full of your joy and your peace. Lord, let our confidence and our trust in you grow. And Lord, let those testimonies in our lives daily multiply. Lord, bring us forward. Let your kingdom advance in our hearts. Here and now, Lord. And if anyone here, keep your heads bowed. If anyone here has thought, or even when I spoke about it a moment ago, that the starting place is fellowship with Jesus, fellowship by Him and through Him with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to just provide a simple prayer for you to take that step and begin that journey. 
And, and, or maybe you want to renew that journey. Maybe you feel like you have just tried and tried. But you know there's a step of dependence, a step of surrender, a step of renewal and commitment to allow the Lord to do it in you. I want to pray that same prayer for you. Father in heaven, I believe that you are the way. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Father, you sent your son to die on a cross for my sins once for all. And you raised him to life through the power of your spirit. And Lord, you sent that spirit into my heart. Lord, fill me with your grace and with your spirit. And I offer to you, Lord, my life to be lived for your glory. Lord, be the Lord of my life and give me your strength, Lord, to follow. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.